Hello everyone, I am Sammy, your devoted manga otaku, and welcome to my manga space. Today I will be discussing all the manga I read in June and July. I had to combine both months because I went on a little family vacation and I just didn't have time to fill a wrap up for June. Plus I only read, I think it was like three manga in June and they were all from the same series so that doesn't really make for great content. <laughs> Speaking of content, I was planning on vlogging my trip, maybe make a little bookstore shop with me video, but I ended up only visiting one bookstore and my dad was with me and I just didn't feel comfortable uh, filming with him right there. Plus he kept picking up manga and flipping through it and then he'd like ask me why there's half naked people inside and I'm like trying to explain fan service to my dad and it was just, it was just a mess. It was an experience. <laughs> Anywho, I'm really excited to share what I've been reading these last two months, so I invite you to grab a coffee or other beverage of your choice and let's talk manga. starting with the manga I liked the least and then work my way up to my favorite reads of these last two months. I've added timestamps throughout so if you're looking for a specific review you can use the timestamps at your convenience. The manga I liked the least this month is actually one I still enjoyed reading. These last two months have been excellent in terms of reading quality. So the first manga I'm going to talk about is Volume 2 of Mint Chocolate by Mami Orikasa. This rom-com shoujo series is published by Yen Press and is rated 13 plus. The last volume of Mint Chocolate left off with Nanami having her classmate and secret crush Kyohei move into her house as her new stepbrother. After some adorable moments and playful scenarios, the messy antics and budding romance between the main leads continues in this second volume. If I'm being completely honest, I'm currently having a love-hate relationship with this manga. What I loved about this manga is that it does a great job of making you feel invested in the characters and the story. We get a lot of wholesome content in this volume, including some over-the-top romantic moments typical of the shoujo genre. We also learn more about Kyohei and Inami's backstory and how their parents' previous relationships affected them mentally. What I hated about this manga is the characters constantly running in circles. Kyohei and Nanami will have a really sweet moment that's ruined with squabbling and bickering, which causes a miscommunication, furthering the leads, doubting that the other person has feelings for them. And then surprise, another romantic moment happens and the cycle just continues. Now, I know that this is a messy shoujo and this kind of behavior is to be expected of the genre, but it gets really annoying and I just want the characters to be together already. <laughs> also, Nanami's loud, always yelling at everyone personality is still irritating and I wish that it was toned down slightly, but that's typical shoujo heroine for you. <laughs> With all that being said, I will be continuing the series, but I'm bumping my star rating from a 4 to a 3.75, mostly because of all the miscommunication in this volume. I'm intrigued to see if the romantic cliffhanger at the end is a misdirect, or if Orikasa Sensei is giving readers exactly what they want. I'm 99.9% .9 sure that the cliffhanger is a misdirect, but... A girlfriend dream. <laughs> Up next is a manga that I read while I was on vacation and that's volume one of the ongoing series Sex Ed 120% story by Kikiki Tatiki and art by Hotomura. <laughs> This seinen shoujo eye story is published by Yen Press and is rated 17 plus. 
This manga follows Nako Suji, an unorthodox health and gym teacher at an all-girls high school. She believes that the school's curriculum is lacking when it comes to sex education and doubts that her students are learning everything they need to know. So Suji Sensei ramps up her teaching to 120% and takes it upon herself to inform her students about all sorts of topics, including self-pleasure, safe sex practices for hetero and same-sex couples, and body positivity. I loved how balanced this manga was in engaging readers in an entertaining story while teaching factual information about sex and sexuality. It's littered with statistics, graphs, fascinating facts, and even includes multiple resources for people interested in more information. I will note that these websites are in Japanese, so they won't be helpful for the average Western reader, but I was still impressed. <laughs> This series also touches on same-sex relationships and provides sex education for people in the LGBTQ plus community, which isn't something commonly included in a modern sex ed curriculum. The manga follows three teenage girls, all with different sexual preferences and body types. One is in a closeted lesbian relationship, another is a BL fanatic, and I suspect the last girl is actually asexual, although nothing has been confirmed yet. I appreciate the diverse viewpoints from these characters and how we get to explore a wide range of topics because these girls ask different questions. Also, Naoko's character is super fun and energetic, and I love how passionate she is when it comes to teaching her students. I am annoyed that Yen Press has given this book a mature rating, a label that I feel distracts from how valuable and informative the manga is. The content isn't even salacious, it's actually surprisingly tame, minus some animatonical illustrations of animal genitalia and one very brief non-explicit instance of oral sex. Many young people would benefit from reading this and I'm just worried that some people might not have access now because of the rating. Ultimately, Sex Ed 120% is a hilarious and educational title that handles awkward subject matter gracefully. The characters are portrayed in a mature and relatable way and I enjoy how the chapters were somewhat episodic with each character teaching a different lesson. I'm giving this volume four stars and I can't wait to see what Suji Sensei teaches in the next volume. The next series I'm going to talk about today is complete at 12 volumes and that's day <laughs> Daytime Shooting Star by Mika Yamamori. This rom-com slice of life story is published by Viz Media and is rated 13 plus I believe I broke my manga binging record with this because I read all 12 books in under 21 hours. I think it's safe to say that there's an addictive quality to this shoujo. <laughs> Our story starts off simple. Plain country girl Suzumi Asano is forced to move from her little countryside town to her uncle's apartment in Tokyo due to her father's transfer overseas. While trying to find her uncle's residence, uh, Suzumi gets hopelessly lost but is rescued by Shishio, a regular customer at her uncle's cafe and her soon-to-be homeroom teacher. While trying to adjust to her new life, Suzumi meets Mamura, a boy in her class who fears getting close to girls. Even though he's uncomfortable, Mamura agrees to be Suzumi's friend, but this friendship quickly develops into one-sided feelings with Mamura falling for Suzumi and Suzumi falling for Shishio. Thus the birth of a drama-filled romance and a formation of the classic love triangle. <laughs> I will say right off the bat, right off the get-go, I'm not a huge fan of love triangles because I find myself disappointed by the outcome 
every time. If my ship doesn't sail, disappointment. If both love interests are equally amazing, disappointment. I can't not be sad for the broken-hearted love interest. It's a lose-lose situation for me. Now, I'm not going to get into the romance too much because I feel like I can't talk about it without giving spoilers, but I will say that I was very, very emotionally invested while reading this. I feel like Yamamori Sensei did a fantastic job at exposing the complexities of an adolescent love, a taboo love, and a first love. I really enjoyed our bumpkin heroine Suzumi. She's kind of tomboyish, but naturally pretty. She loves to eat, she isn't overly sensitive or emotional, and she cries like a normal human being. Can't relate. <laughs> I liked that she's tough and she doesn't let her feelings influence the choices that she makes for herself. In addition, I found how she copes with her emotions relatable and indicative, indicative? Am I using that word right? <laughs> indicative of a normal teenager. <laughs> she was a breath of fresh air and is very different from typical shoujo protagonists. I absolutely adored Suzumi's gaggle of girlfriends, especially her frenemy Yuyuka. I love their friendship. It felt raw and real and Yuyuka's sharp and cynical personality is hilarious. <laughs> All of the supporting characters were interesting and fleshed out, which I love to see. And I quickly have to mention Suzumi's uncle because I thought he was a loving and caring guardian throughout the series. I found it so funny that he's often mistaken for being gay because he loves shopping for cute frilly nightgowns for Suzumi. <laughs> She's always sporting a nightgown that her uncle bought her. <laughs> As for the boys, Shishio, Suzumi's teacher, isn't just incredibly charming and charismatic, He's handsome, easygoing, and is always beaming with big smiles. He's also kind of a dork, and he even collects shoujo manga. I love that. I think his feelings for Suzumi are so sweet and so genuine. He cares for her so deeply. Also, the nickname he gives her is so cute. <laughs> Obviously, there is an age gap between these characters, but I never felt like Suzumi was being groomed or pressured into anything physically inappropriate. At a first glance, he comes off childish, but I think his character is actually very mature and rational. Honestly, he made my heart flutter every time he was on the page. <laughs> now, Mamura is kind of the opposite to Shishio in that he's quiet. He's seemingly cold and introverted, but in actuality, he's a sweetheart. A very natural and basic sundere character. In the beginning of the story, he has issues being around women and blushes profusely at the physical contact with them. It reminded me a lot of Kuyis from middle school. <laughs> I will admit that the reasoning behind his shyness could have been written better because I didn't feel like it was very realistic. Mamura's constant kindness towards Suzumi is just so heartwarming and I liked that he comforts her both physically and emotionally. He's always first and foremost a friend to Suzumi and I appreciated how much he valued their friendship. Both boys have their flaws, but I can't get into the specifics without giving away key details and spoilers of the story. I love both of these characters for different reasons. Both are special to me, and that's why I hate love triangles. And that's all I'm gonna say about uh, these boys. <laughs> when I finished the last volume, I accepted the ending, but the more that I thought about it, the more that I realized how poorly written it was. The ending of this series feels rushed. It didn't feel complete or satisfying to me. It isn't even about, you know, which love interest was chosen. 
it's more about getting closure. I can only assume things ended so abruptly because Yamamori Sensei really wanted to have a big reveal. She wanted Suzumi to make her final choice. I really enjoyed this series and I don't regret reading it. I just felt like some storyline and character development were tossed aside in the name of this big reveal. Before wrapping things up, I have to comment on Yamamori Sensei's drawing style and how pretty and clean it was. I love how each character has a unique design. I was never confused as to who was who. I love Suzumi's fashion and hairstyles throughout the manga. It was never gaudy or over the top. I noticed that the art even improved a little throughout the volumes and I welcome these small improvements. It's a very beautiful series. It's also funny and sweet and romantic and heartbreaking. I actually cried quite a bit throughout this series, especially reading, I think it was volume seven, the feels. <laughs> I will be giving this series a solid four stars. I recommend this manga to people who love shoujo, um, love triangles, and romance stories about falling in love and all the happiness and heartache that accompanies those experiences. The third manga that I'm going to talk about today is Volume 6 of the Jose title Something's Wrong With Us by Natsumi Endo. This thrilling romance murder mystery is published by Kodansha Comics and is rated 16 plus. For those that don't know, this series follows Nao, a 21-year-old woman who's masterfully skilled in the art of wagashi, a traditional Japanese confection. Nao is a seemingly normal confectioner, but she's concealing a terrible secret. Her mother was framed for murder 15 years ago. To make matters worse, <laughs> the person who did the framing was Nao's childhood friend Tsubaki, a now rival confectioner. Believing her late mother is innocent, Nao is committed to uncovering the truth of who really murdered Tsubaki's father and their motives. First off, I just want to say that I'm always so impressed with Ando Sensei's breathtaking art style and attention to detail, especially regarding the different confectionery. I've mentioned this before, but I've enjoyed learning about Wagashi, the symbolism behind these traditional sweets and how they are made is fascinating to me. It also makes me want to eat Wagashi. <laughs> Now, I think this volume is the juiciest of the series so far. I felt like I couldn't turn the pages fast enough. Near the end of the volume, Nao ends up discovering a few scandalous and exciting secrets. And I'm surprised that this reveal happens so early in the series because the things that she learns are kind of game changing. The secrets themselves were predictable in my opinion, but I have no clue what Nao is going to do with this information. I'm so stressed for her and Tsubaki as well. I actually feel really, really bad for him because he's been left in the dark for most of the series. And I think he's going to be really heartbroken when the secrets and the lies come to light. I'm very worried. I recently found out that in Japan, the series is ongoing with 15 volumes available. I was kind of taken aback by that number because what else could possibly happen? How does this series get any crazier? It's already so messy. Learning that there's still so much story left, it really ramped up my excitement. Unfortunately, the next installment isn't available until February 2022. And we'll have to wait to see how the story unfolds. Overall, this volume has been my favorite of the series so far, and I'm going to give it five stars. If murder mysteries, revenge plots, and soap operas are your jam, I highly recommend that you pick this series up. 
And next up will be discussing a manga I talked highly of in my mid manga freak out tag video, and that's volume six of the series Sweat and Soap by Kintetsu Yamada. This rom com, slice of life, seinen, is published by Kodansha Comics and is rated 16 plus. In volume five of Sweat and Soap, readers got to revel in the wholesomeness of Kotaro and Asako spending Christmas together. And in this volume, the happy couple is celebrating other occasions, including their first Valentine's Day and Asako's birthday. I absolutely adored this. Asako and Kotaro's relationship develops so much in this book as they experience the typical ups and downs of any relationship. The happy twosome hit a few speed bumps in this volume and it was nice to watch how this power couple handles some very basic relationship issues. I'm thrilled to report that even the drama in this slice of life story is realistic and it isn't over the top. I even teared up a little at the end. It was very emotional. <laughs> I really love watching Kataro and Asako and their relationship. I love watching them grow and change as individuals too, especially Asako. I love when she tries and enjoys new things with newfound confidence. It's very inspiring. I feel like I keep repeating myself, but I enjoy seeing these two continuously depict a strong, healthy relationship complete with consideration for each other's feelings and flawless communication. As always, Yamada Sensei's artwork is wonderful, quirky, and playful, and it captures the awkward and charming personality of the leads beautifully. I don't think anyone is surprised when I give this manga five stars, and I'm so excited to read the next installment, which is upstairs in a box somewhere. <laughs> The next series I'm going to be talking about is Volume 2 of A Sign of Affection by Sue Morishita. This manga is a slice of life romance shoujo. It's published by Kodansha Comics and is rated 16 plus. In the first volume of A Sign of Affection, we're introduced to university, university students Yuki and Itsuomi, who meet by chance on the train. These characters are curious of each other, which naturally draws them together. Itsumi takes an interest in how our deaf heroine communicates through sign language, and Yuki is interested in learning more about Itsumi's travels and experiences, as she's lived a very sheltered life. In this volume, we get to see them spend more time together and watch as their friendship grows into what could be a budding romance. I'm so blown away with how beautiful and pure this story is. It's one of the cutest manga I've read, and even though it's adorable and makes my heart smile, the characters and the storyline are still mature. It's so nice reading a manga where the characters are attending university. It introduces so many new settings and scenarios which are different from other shoujo manga. Like the scene where Yuki and Itsuomi go shopping at Costco with their friends. I didn't know I could be so excited watching people shop for groceries. <laughs> Itsuomi is such a great male love interest. He makes my heart all fluttery and you can tell that he adores Yuki by how he treats her. He's so kind towards her and thoughtful of her disability, but he doesn't baby her. He just takes extra care when communicating with Yuki. And watching Yuki teach Itsuomi sign language and then watching Itsuomi use it and seeing Yuki's face light up, oh my gosh, the fluffiness of these moments. <laughs> I really liked that in between some of the chapters, Morishita Sensei explains how they translate Japanese sign language into this manga form, and they break it down step by step. I am a sucker for informational tidbits from mangaka. <laughs> I think they are so neat and a treat to read. Also, can we take a moment to appreciate this cover? 
so pretty. And the back cover, more Ishida Sensei's art style is so pretty. It's so pretty and I just, I just love it. I love it so much. <laughs> Hands down, this volume gets five stars from me. I'm completely invested in the story and in the main characters and supporting characters. Everyone is fleshed out. The pacing is excellent. And overall, everything is playing out naturally and realistically. The second last manga I'll be talking about today makes my heart melt every time I read it, and that's volume six of the adorable shoujo title, Living Room Matsunaga-san by Keiko Iwashita. This slice of life age gap romance is rated 16 plus and is published by Kodansha Comics. Basically, this manga follows 17 year old Miko as she discovers her independence while living with five other tenants in her uncle's boarding house. Miko's new roommates are all adult professionals and slowly she learns that adults shouldn't be put on a pedestal. They're regular people with flaws and insecurities and problems. During this coming of age tale, Miko is also learning to coexist with the bossy cranky, but overall kind-hearted Jun Matsunaga-san, whom she can't help but have romantic feelings for. If you watched my Jun book haul, you could probably tell how thrilled I was to finally have this six volume just by how I unboxed it. <laughs> I'm happy to report that I adored this and welcomed everything that this volume had to offer. The pacing in this series is incredible. Iwashita Sensei does a spectacular job of creating tension between the characters and things are really starting to progress and heat up. <laughs> There's a really heartwarming occasion celebrated in this volume and everyone in the boarding house comes together to support and create something special. This isn't the first time that we've seen these characters help each other and lend a hand. Um, Matsunaga, Matsunaga-san's birthday and the preparations for Miko's school festival are also examples of instances where these pure-hearted characters come together to support one another. These moments are some of my favorite in this series and I couldn't help but get emotional during the celebration. I think things are going to get a little messy in future volumes, but I didn't feel like the messiness is a true threat to Nico and June's relationship. I say relationship in air quotations because they aren't really in a relationship. <laughs> I guess I'm trying to be optimistic because I really treasure these two with all my heart and I don't want anything to come between them. This volume gets a total of five stars from me. I'm so excited for volume seven in September. Also the cover art for the seventh volume is probably my favorite of all the covers so far. I'm so excited. <laughs> the last series I'm gonna talk about today is one that I was so eager to read and I've been eager to read this series for a long time and it did not disappoint. And that's volumes one through five of the Shonen series, Spy Family by Tetsuya Endo. This Viz Media publication has a mix of comedy, action, romance, and slice of life themes and is rated 14 plus. The story, follows Agent Twilight, a master spy whose next undercover assignment is to infiltrate a prestigious academy. His cover requires him to obtain a family and although difficult, Twilight is able to procure both a wife and daughter while assuming the identity of a psychiatrist named Lloyd Forger. However, Twilight isn't the only family member concealing secrets. His new bride is a deadly assassin, and his adopted daughter is a telepath. <laughs> Will this dysfunctional household be able to keep their secrets while also learning what it means to become a family? This 
manga is magnificent in all categories. I think it's rare finding a manga that I feel confident recommending to anyone, no matter their demographic preferences and their taste. Plus, the series would be perfect for people who are new to manga or just starting to read manga. It's well written with beautifully structured, structured panels. The pacing is smooth and consistent, and there's never a dull moment. Every page propels the story forward. In addition, Endo Sensei balances the serious and comical elements perfectly so that even when the stakes are high, the lightheartedness and humor of the story makes it very entertaining. And this is actually really easy to read too. One of the reasons I think this series is so popular is because of the unique and unpredictable storyline. This is nothing like I've ever read before, and it really stands out compared to other manga. At first you expect this typical and generic spy story, but at its core, this series is about family and what it means to be a family. Another reason why I suspect Spy Family is so popular, maybe even the selling point of the manga, is the characters. Twilight, or Lloyd Forger, is an exceptionally skilled and highly trained spy who is the best of the best when it comes to his line of work. Personality-wise, he's cold, calculating, and a perfectionist and will do whatever it takes to complete his mission. Twilight avoids human attachments in order to do his job efficiently, but we're starting to peel back some layers and revealing what could be a sweet and caring father figure. He's also the most mysterious character of the bunch, and I'm hoping we get some insight into his backstory soon. Now your forger, also known as the Thorn Princess, is a formidable and competent assassin. Yor is cool and intelligent, which I expected because she's an assassin, but what surprised me was how socially awkward and shy she is when interacting in her day-to-day -day activities. Yor is also really kind, and because she raised her younger brother, she has a strong maternal instinct, which shines through when she's with Anya. I especially loved that she has a horrifically morbid, morbid thought process, which makes for some great comedy when Anya secretly reads her mind. <laughs> now, little Anya Forger is a riot. <laughs> She's just as mischievous as she is adorable and her facial expressions are hysterical. Definitely my favorite character. Anya comes off as simple, but she's pretending to be six when she's actually four or five. I couldn't imagine my four-year-old undertaking academics meant for a six-year-old. When I first started reading Spy Family, I thought Anya was going to be a side character, but I'd argue that she's the most important character in the series. Because of her mind-reading abilities, she knows everyone's secrets, allowing her to solve problems and intervene when things are spiraling. Without her, this little family would have crumbled long ago. <laughs> but she also has to be careful that she interferes and in indirect ways so that she doesn't expose her own powers. I love her so much. <laughs> She's so wonderful and she really knows how to tug on the heartstrings. <laughs> All three MCs are fleshed out, detailed and interesting individuals, which makes for amusing and unique interactions. Being a forger has impacted them all positively, and it's heartwarming to watch them all grow and develop compassion and concern for each other. Even the side characters in this series have charm and personality. Before wrapping things up, 
I just want to say quickly that the art is very well done. The action scenes are awesome and easy to follow and the cute moments are tender and sweet. It's too early to call this manga one of my favorites of all time because it is still ongoing, but I wouldn't be surprised if this series makes it into my top 10, maybe top 5 after it's finished. This manga gets five stars from me and I can't wait to read volume six in October. And with that, we have finally come to the end of June and July's manga wrap up. I would love to know what you guys have read so far this summer. So let me know in the comment section below. If you're interested in watching more videos from me, you can check out my end card where I'll have links to my most recent videos. I hope you all have a magnificent day and I'll see you in my next video.